That doesn't count. Look, I know there's a lot of doctors here, and there's a lot of scientists. You might feel it's doing you good. In the world of science, that has no value whatsoever. Yeah, 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 we've got 300,000 balanced tests. It's the biggest library of tests in the world. We are the world's experts, no doubt. What does that prove? Absolutely nothing. I mean, it's... It proves nothing. Look, I can talk to you guys and you... You're very nice to me. You applaud me when I come on stage. You think that I'm telling you something that's worthwhile and substantive. And I think I am too. But when I go back to the university and I have to talk to my colleagues there, it's a very different situation. They're skeptics. Every good scientist should be a skeptic. And they say to me, well, what evidence do you have for these ridiculous claims that you're making? And I say, well, we've got 300,000 balance tests. And they say, okay, well, you're measuring something, but what value does that have? What does that prove? Absolutely nothing. And then I say, well, we have a lot of customer experiences. We have amazing experiences. You know, like the story I told you yesterday about this child with the developmental problems who, for the first time in seven years, gets to sleep in his own bed. And we're changing that child's entire life. And we're also making the parents' lives a lot more interesting, too. Great. We hear stories like that. And I can tell you many more. People with very serious illness, people who were dying, who have been brought back to life by the Lazarus effect that we create with our amazing pharmaceutical nutritional products. Just yesterday, an American gentleman who I haven't met before came up to me and said, you saved my life. And I said, I did? What? How did I do that? And then he told me that he had had a very severe autoimmune condition, which was making his life risible, risible, absolutely miserable, wretched, un not worth living. And he started, someone had introduced him to the Zinzino products, he started to take them. And when I met him yesterday, I mean, he, he looked great. He looked great. And he was saying, look, his doctors are amazed by the change that they've seen in him. And you've seen people like this too. We've seen hundreds, actually we've seen tens of thousands of them. And I tell that to my colleagues at the university, and they say, so what? <laughs> that proves nothing. And then, of course, you have your own experiences, and many of you had or have had health problems, and you start using xenobiotic you know, extend and balance oil, and you know in yourselves, you feel a lot better. You notice that your high blood pressure goes away. You've noticed that perhaps some in joint pains that you might have had disappear. Dermatitis, psoriasis. Problems that many, many people have because of this toxic, <laughs> fucked up world that we live in, they go away. They go away. <laughs> I'm sorry about the technical language. <laughs> so your own experiences are absolutely convincing to you because you know, you know how you used to be and you know how you are now. And I mentioned that sort of thing to my colleagues, and they say, so what? None of this proves anything at all, because although this data is real, and it's highly meaningful to us and to the people whose lives we save, whose lives we improve, that does not qualify as scientific data. If you ask the clinical scientists what types of evidence would convince them they will say, well, there is a hierarchy of different qualities of evidence. And, you know, for the doctors and the scientists here, you know all about this. This is uh, the UPATI levels of evidence pyramid, and that it's very base. Those are the lowest levels of evidence. You have editorials and expert opinion. Experts are at the bottom of the heap. Experts like me, we're not worth much. Above that, you have case series or case reports, and those are written up detailed analysis of the customers, the patients that we see and that we treat. And we build up a repertoire of such cases and we can arrange them in a systematic form, we can crunch the numbers. That is starting to become a little more valuable. Then you have case control studies and cohort studies that they show things like relative risk. 
Interesting. Not great. Above that, now we're getting to the most meaningful layer of all. You have randomized clinical trials. That's the second part of the talk. And at this point, you're starting to generate information that clinical scientists and doctors will take very seriously. <coughs> and then at the top of this pyramid, and not everybody would agree with this, you have these very large sprawling studies, meta-analyses, where you take all the clinical trials, you add them all up together, and you see where you can find overwhelming trends that emerge from this body of data. Some people say this should be the top level. That's not always true. There are, in many cases, major problems with meta-analyses. They can be desperately flawed if they hoover up different kinds of studies which use different kinds of measures and make the assumption that all of them are saying the same thing. If you add up a lot of apples, oranges, and bananas and try and make sense out of that, it actually can lead you down the wrong path. So meta-analyses are not necessarily the top level. In many cases, it is the randomized clinical trial that is the best level of evidence. If we want to bring the medical profession on the side, and we do, these are the people that we need to be working with. These are the people that we need to inform and to collaborate with and to help, and we want them to help us. We need to move from where we are now, which is really at a very low level indeed. Just the cases that we deal with personally in our daily lives and in our business. And what we have to do is to move up towards the top of this pyramid. I would say actually this is the top of the pyramid in many ways. We have to move to the level of randomized perspective, placebo-controlled, double-blinded clinical trials. So that's what we're now doing. First of all, we had to identify which area we wanted to look at. We wanted to find a health condition <coughs> which met all of our key criteria. So we wanted to find a health condition which is currently not curable. And of course, there is many of those. In fact, almost all health conditions are currently incurable with the exception of the bacterial infections. Everything else is uncurable because the pharmaceutical industry is pointing in the wrong direction. They have no cures for everything, really. So we have plenty to start with. Then we wanted to find a condition that involved a lot of people, infected a lot of people, because whenever we had a result, if we generate a good result, we ought to be able to take this out and roll it out into a large market. So a disease which has no cure, which affects a lot of people, we have budgetary restraints, and we can't build too many bells and whistles and detailed protocols into the study. We need something that we can track relatively easily and cheaply. And we also wanted a condition that people out there in the wider world who wanted to self-medicate, or doctors who wanted to treat themselves or their family members, that they could easily see for themselves that this was something that was working. So this condition, whatever it was, has to be something that is easily and cheaply and conveniently monitored, or you can self-monitor. No point in doing anything if you can't measure it. So I'm sure that a lot of you by this stage have already worked out what that condition is. Migraine. Migraine. <laughs> <laughs> High blood pressure. <laughs> High blood pressure. Okay, let's be a little more specific. Blood pressure. Blood, pressure. blood pressure, exactly. Essential hypertension. This is a very, very common condition. So I'm not talking about the relatively rare cases of hypertension which are caused by problems in the kidneys, the adrenals, or the pituitary gland, but essential hypertension, which now affects almost half the entire population of the developed world. Very, very common. And everybody assumes it gets all higher and gets worse as you get older, and it's part of growing old. Not true, because we know that in the blue zones, your blood pressure does not increase as you get older. And the doctors call it essential hypertension when they say essential. What they're actually saying is, we don't know what causes it. That's what essential means. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm a little croaky. I had to fly, I had to travel for 16 hours to get here yesterday, breathing cheap airplane recycled air. Sorry about that. <laughs> so essential hypertension, many of the doctors still feel, because this is what they're taught, it's just a condition that happens as you get older. Not true. What we now understand is that essential hypertension is caused by chronic inflammation, 
affecting the arterioles, the resistance vessels, which, as all doctors know, increases TPR, total peripheral resistance, as your arteries constrict. The heart is pumping the same amount of blood through narrowed vessels, so the pressure goes up. And they treat it with a whole range of drugs, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, none of which are particularly effective, none of which cure the disease. But we know that it's in the majority of cases caused by chronic inflammatory stress, and we know how to cure that, don't we? So, we need a robust protocol, because what we're hoping to achieve is a result which shows that the medical profession has been wrong all along. That we do know what high central hypertension is, that it is curable, and that you do not need to rely on the cheap, shoddy, and toxic tools supplied by the pharmaceutical industry. So we have, so we have to design a study which will withstand criticism from all sides, because we will be criticized. We're going up against the big guys now. We're declaring war. <laughs> We are attacking the current medical consensus. We are attacking the pharmaceutical industry where it hurts. And you think they won't push back? You're crazy. They're going to come after us with everything they've got. So our clinical trial has to be able to withstand substantial criticism. It has to be designed very, very carefully. And we've spent almost a year getting it right. I've been working with Andrew Agulis, who many of you know, who's been invaluable in this particular project. And we ended up negotiating with a very senior ethics committee, which you have to do, you have to get ethics committee approval in order to do a trial like this. We finally achieved this. And it is on the basis of a clinical study which meets all of the internationally accepted and demanded quality control criteria. So they include double blind. And that means that neither the person who is receiving the treatment nor the person giving to them knows whether it is the active or a placebo, which means, obviously, the study has to be placebo-controlled. Half of the people that are coming to the study will receive a version of balance oil, and the other half will receive <coughs> oil, which, as we know, doesn't work. So this study has been designed to do two things. First of all, to show that balance oil works, and secondly, to show that the entire fish oil works.
sorry about all the geek stuff, we have to do that. And I just wanted to assure you that you've done it all very conservatively and very, very carefully. So as I said, we finally managed to get ethical uh, committee approval. Thank you again to Andrew Argolis. Uh, we have a really uh, an outstanding lead investigator. Um, <laughs> But more importantly, more importantly, we have really good senior, high-level, very competent, additional staff, clinical people who will be actually working on a day-to-day -day basis with the study, following it through, and making sure that the correct procedures are followed. And then we have a proper paper trail, so that later on, once the results are published, and everybody starts coming to get us, we'll be able to say, we did everything right. We're not taking any chances. So here are the details of the protocols, 120 subjects with established, essential, and stable hypertension. We're going to be doing a balance test when they first appear, and then we'll be doing it at two and four months, and then again at two monthly intervals all the way through if they continue to stay in the study. We will be taking standardized blood pressure uh, measurements at a specific time of day in a specifically controlled environment once every day, and then we will be following also their drug requirements because as their blood pressure returns to normal, what happens, and I've seen this in many, many people taking balance oil, yeah. gradually you can reduce like your dose of medications pressure. because you simply don't need them anymore. So as your so blood pressure goes higher. And really, this, this is why the pharmaceutical industry hates us because we're hitting them in the pocket. We're going to be taking your business away from you. That's what's happening here. And I believe within the majority of cases, what we'll find as we reach four months and they continue perhaps to the six month time point, that for most of these people, they will become drug free. This is in practice what I've already seen in hundreds of cases. And then we're measuring something else which is called SOLI, that stands for quality of life years. Well, we're probably not going to do the life part because we won't be following these patients for years, I don't think. But we will be measuring quality of life. How do these patients feel? Because as we give them balance oil, you know for yourselves, you know from yourselves that other things start getting better. Their mood starts to improve. Joint pains start to disappear. All kinds of things happen, and we're helping to be able to pick up those things as well as we monitor these patients as they go through the study. And the placebo, as I said, is fish oil. So that's one in the eye to the fish oil industry. Now we were going to give them a version of balanced oil, it could have been Aqua X, but the problem is it's very hard to make a placebo for fish oil that looks and tastes like fish oil or balanced oil, but isn't. So we're going to be using the next generation product, which is, as you know, it's a scent omega. This is very concentrated fish oil. It's the concentrated olive oil. And then we're going to be adding additional polyphenols, a spectrum of polyphenols. There is still under some discussion. We're doing various, we're having discussions and debates about that at the moment. So this is just fine tuning, but that's what's going on. Per capsule, it's 417 milligrams of the long chain omega sixes, the extra virgin olive oil, the polyphenols from olive. Uh, that we think at the moment is going to be some cacao extract, which is also rich in polyphenols, other sources of polyphenols, and vitamin D. That's the input. That's the input. The placebo will be simply fish oil, but without the polyphenols and without the vitamin D. And at the final end point is, once we've studied the data, once we've tabulated everything, and we've worked out what it means, we're going to publish in a high impact factor cardio journal like the European Heart Journal, the MJ Cardiol, one of the top journals, and I believe they're going to accept it because of the care that we've taken in designing the protocol, and because what we're doing is really very revolutionary indeed. <laughs> Once we have that article printed, we're going to print thousands of copies and send those copies to all the skeptics and we are going to educate the damn doctors, those who are here.
takes us, you know, to the next level. The next level, which is where we should be and where we have always been aiming to be in this environment, which at the moment, this health space is dominated by the pharmaceutical industry, the doctors, the food industry, and to a limited extent by the summit companies. Now, all of those interactions are pretty negative. Food makes you sick, the pharmaceutical industry treats the symptoms of the disease caused by the diet, but doesn't do anything else. That's a kind of very unhealthy, negative alliance. Supplement industry tries to make up what the food industry lacks, but makes a complete hash of it, their formulations are junk. The pharmaceutical industry doesn't even care about supplements because they know they don't work, because they dominate the medical profession. They determine, to a large extent, the teaching courses at universities where medical students are educated, and they dominate post-qualification education. Most doctors never get to learn anything about food or nutrition. They just get told how to prescribe pharmaceuticals. That's how it used to be, and this is where we're going. This is where we're going. We're going to take that center stage, and we're going to command it. And we're going to educate... We're going to. <laughs> we're going to shrink the pharmaceutical industry. We're going to eat their lunch and their breakfast and dinner too. By the time we're done, they're going to be at the in the cheap seats at the back. We're going to be forefront and center stage, and we're going to start, I think, to change the entire supplements market. They're going to have to pay attention to what we're doing, what we produce, what we work with. They actually work. You know that for yourself. Taking fish oil or a large vitamin C tablet has no effect whatsoever. And we're going to change the food industry forever because they are going to have to come to terms with what we're doing and they're going to have to take responsibility for the shoddy and toxic products that they currently sell on the mass market. Yeah. Well, hey. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank you.